In this chapter, we're going to talk about getting and using customer feedback. We're going to do this at the very end. We're covering a lot of material. There's, there's like a literally maybe 10 entrepreneurs, by the way, just so you know, who gave us insight into what has to be covered in this course. The collective experience of those entrepreneurs might be, it probably is like 500 years. And we're taking all this information that we have about being an entrepreneur and putting it into like eight hours or, or however long the course is going to take. But what does business success drill down to before I get into customers? Serving your customers well, having a good product, working hard. And we're going to end the course with the big reminders, but I want to mention that. I would almost say if you serve customers well and you are monomaniacal about it, you are just crazed about that, you're going to be successful in business. So word of mouth ad advertising is the most important factor to success. We've talked about that. It's true. That's never going away. There are things that are facsimiles to it that still don't overlay perfectly on the power of word of mouth advertising. Yelp is a facsimile to word of mouth advertising. But what your customers say about you is vital and that's why you want to make sure that customers are happy point number two is you need some type of system in place to regularly get customer feedback since it's so important that system does not need to be super complex but i always want to know what customers think about my product or my company i always want to know um really know I ran a software company. I, I can't remember the percentage of banks we were installed in the U.S., but it was really high. But even then, we focus group like 5 or 10% of them per year. And when I say focus group, I mean go out and visit them because I always want to see that customer and ask them how they're, are they happy with our product. And, but you need some type of system to regularly, regularly get feedback. Um, what are the sources of customer feedback? Uh, remember, too, before we get into this um, too much, a customer relationship management system does not equal customer service. Um, in technology, the industry I'm in, we often mistake technology for value. There are very good CRM systems that help you keep track of what customers um, what's going on with customers. But that doesn't mean you're serving customers well. That means that you just have a catalog of them. So don't mistake technology for service is my point. But how do we get information from customers? We can do customer surveys. There's SurveyMonkey out there. I, I actually got a haircut. I have less hair now than I used to, but I got a haircut last week. And... Um, it was really unbelievable. I, I was really impressed. Got my hair cut, and I was sent a, a survey by SurveyMonkey. I guess through the, the company uses SurveyMonkey. You know, how do you like your hair cut and all this other stuff. And I was really impressed. I'm like, wow. Now, I'd be impressed more if they were read those surveys and they did something based upon those results. So one thing I don't know if I'm going to get to, so I want to mention it now. It's important to do surveys and have suggestion boxes or whatever to find out what's going on with the customers. But it's more important to take the information and do something with it, right? Information is not valuable on its own in any format. Information is only valuable when you take the information and do something with it. When I ran laundromats, we did suggestion boxes. Amazing the feedback we got in those suggestion boxes in the laundromat chain. Quite literally, I ran those laundromats through suggestion boxes. People would put little suggestions in there, and they would tell you things. It's amazing what you would find out. But I would stack them all up, go through every single one. And there were thousands of customers. But you get very rich information from information. You get very rich information and data 
from blind formats where people can just make a suggestion with impunity and they, they know that you know, they're not going to be embarrassed or called out. Depending upon the business, you can call customers on a regular basis. Um, if you have customers in disparate locations and say, hey, how are we doing? Do you like us? Is there something we can do better? Um, by the way, in every single format here, try to avoid rote sort of surveys or rote questions or um, this is a mistake we've even made at the foundation. And what we made early on was like, did you like the seminar? Yes or no? Well, who's going to say no? You know, that's like this course we're giving. Did you like the course? Yes or no? Well, I mean, it's going to probably be free. But if it's not free, it's going to be super cheap. So you're going to say yes because most people are nice. That's not the right question. The real question is between one and ten, one being the course stunk and ten being it was the greatest thing ever. What number would you give us, right? But no replacement for actually talking to people, okay? So that gets to the next point, in-person meetings. It is amazing to me what I learn when I go visit a customer. You know, I hate hearkening back to my experience, but I do like stories more than me just lecturing at you. I ran a tech company. Tech companies are notoriously bad at service. It would amaze me when I went out to a customer what I would learn about the evils we were per perpetrating on the, that customer by a lack of service. And you can read body language and you, le you learn about their lives. The other thing about in-person meetings, very powerful, and I don't mean to be flip, I'm totally seriously. When you meet with someone in person, you realize they're a real person. There's pictures of their kids, the husband, the wife, or whatever. It becomes more real to you. The fact that there is a tornado today in Pakistan or what, you know, whatever it is, is, is uh, really tragic. But if we were actually in Pakistan and we saw the devastation, it would be more real. So the reason I like in-person meetings is because it's real. And we used to force our employees to go out and meet the customers, go out and meet the people who are writing the checks. And they learned a lot. And we did that even with developers, who are not the most social people in the world, by the way. Emails, you can send out emails. I'm not super thrilled with email feedback. I'm thrilled with any feedback. But I always worry... I worry about a lot of things with, with emails. I worry about the only people who are responding are the people who like your product or service. Be skeptical, be cynical, be proactive. Maniac is too strong. Be, but I'm going to use it, be a maniac and a detective and a researcher about customer feedback. Just assume you're not getting the real story from customers as to how much they like your product or service. The reason this is so important is because if you do this, I can assure you, your competition's not doing this and you're gonna be successful, okay? This whole course should be customer service. If we just got that to you, we're gonna be fine. Should be monitoring social media, quantify success, for, for example, in a company, we do surveys and we do survey one to 10. We want people to be satisfied at least at an eight and a half level. Anybody below that, we're gonna call them and we're gonna find out why they're not happy. So in a way you're quantifying success. You should always have numbers and know where we are. Uh, even though we run a foundation, we're getting more metrics driven, more numbers driven, because that tells you the real story of how happy people are. The importance of 100% satisfaction, great way to end the chapter. What a great way to end the chapter. This is a call, a call out to Michael Adams. Good job in putting this point last on the screen, Michael. 100% um, customer satisfaction. There is not a business leader in the country who will not agree with that. That's a bumper sticker. It's meaningless on its own. What does it really say? They will say that, but do they really believe that? 
And I cannot tell you how much training that I've had to do around this through the various years of running companies. Every employee, every owner has got to truly believe that. If you don't believe that, do not go into business. I know business owners who have struggled for years. They are never going to be successful. I mean, I don't want to say that because you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. They're not going to be successful. But they always make slight arguments as to why this customer is unreasonable or that customer is unreasonable. And they're real logical. And they're so... But you know what? In other words, nobody argues with the importance of customer satisfaction. But people argue around the fringed, fringes in this specific example. Well, the customer expected this, and I'm not going to do that. And that the customer paid for this. Why would I do that? No, 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 no. Your job is to get that customer satisfied, period. Every single one of them. Now, let me, I've got two things to say about this, and I think it's a nice way to end this chapter. First of all, I might be going a little overboard. But I believe there's a moral, moral imperative to that, meaning you're out in the market. They're paying you money, even if they, you think they're unreasonable. They paid you money. You owe it to them to make them successful. But here's the second thing I'm going to say. And this, um, this is like one of those things you think about in like in five or ten. It takes five or ten years to sink in. But I, it took a while for it to sink in with me. Let's say, because some of you are entrepreneurs and you're listening to this and you're like, well, what about this case? I'm like, no, they're still right. And I'm going to explain to you why. Suppose you get a customer who is completely unreasonable. They're the unreasonable people. They're totally unreasonable. They don't want to pay for the service. They don't, uh, they're calling you all the time and badgering you and, um, My point to that is, who's responsible for that still? There's only one answer. There is only one plausible answer. This is mathematical. It's you. Because who picked that customer? Interesting, isn't it? It's amazing how often I had to give that lecture. And I hate the word lecture, but it kind of is. I had to give that lecture. No one put a gun to your head to accept that customer. See what I mean? You accepted that customer into your, your, your university. Once you do that, they're in your university. Once they're in your circle, once they're in that circle, you have to make sure that they are completely satisfied. You are responsible for unreasonable customers. Think about it. It's true and incredibly powerful. You're in control of that. Now, if you have a year contract, with an unreasonable person, that doesn't mean you need to keep that customer. But once you invite them into your world, into your university, you and only you are 100% responsible for their satisfaction, no matter what anybody says and no matter how good your arguments are. Do that and you'll be, you'll be successful in business period.